Hare Krishna. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvishesha Sunyavari Pastyatya De Satarine Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Sita Ram, Lakshman, Hanuman Ji Ki so, so we have uh, designated this particular presentation on some of the background of the appearance of the Lord. It says in the Bhagavad Gita, Yadaya Dai Dharmasya, Glanir Bhavati Bharata, Abhutanam Dharmasya Tadatmaham Srijamiyaham. This verse is actually fundamental to practically all the manifestations and incarnations of the Lord, but particularly in relationship to Sri Ram's appearance. Um, from time to time, and even now in the present uh, society we live in, the world gets overburdened with irreligion, sinful activities, and persons who propagate sinful activities in the name of progress for humankind. So we see that wherever that situation becomes a burden on Mother Earth, and Mother Earth is a devotee. She's a very great devotee of the Lord. And when the burden becomes too much, and the population becomes disturbed, and the demons become profusely in abundance, and then something is done on the higher realms to rectify the situation. Many times, a great soul will appear to uh, change the direction of the world, and the Lord will send someone from his personal entourage to do the work. But sometimes even that is not enough. And so when that, and when it becomes out of proportion, then he comes himself. <laughs> and uh, in this particular situation, we see there was a great burden on the earth. One powerful Rakshasa. Rakshasas are more advanced than the humans. There's a planet that's outside of the earth planet it evolves around the Earth. It's an invisible planet, and it's the planet of the Rakshashas. There's many, many various types of living beings who are considered within the category of the 400,000 human beings who have various characteristics and, what we say, activities that are either above the human beings in terms of piety and morality and religiosity, and then there are those who are lower. Rakshasas is an interesting race. And actually, the word raksha asa means uh, the word raksha means protection. Actually, and but these persons actually are exploiting the humans because they are more intelligent in one sense and also more powerful. <laughs> you can see the intelligence of Ravana. But there is two kinds of intelligence. One is called Shrukitina and Duskritina and Shrukritina. Shrukitina means that intelligence which is beneficial for that person and for others. It propagates religious activities it uh, helps to develop society in so many, what we say, needed ways. But then we have the other one, duskritina, it means good intelligence but wrongly directed. <laughs> wrongly directed in a sense that it simply causes people to become more and more away from God rather than more and more towards God. So even today we see in that in the world there are a class of people who are very much duskritin, 
They're always making things in the society that, would, that pushes God out and propagates the principles of materialism as the goal of life. <laughs> and uh, the world is somewhat... Of course, in this age, and what we present age, we live in the Lord is incarnated in the sound of his name. Kali Kale Nama Rupa Krishna Avatar Nama Hoite Hoya Sarva Jagat Nishtara. So that is actually considered to be an incarnation of the Lord. It's non different than the Lord, and the Lord appears in this sound vibration of himself in this age to rectify and purify the conditioned souls. And uh, he also sends his representatives, the great spiritual teachers and others, to uh, lay the groundwork for the propagation of the Lord's appearance in the form of the Holy Name. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is actually also the incarnation in this age. So both the Lord has come in the sound of his name and also his personal incarnation and so many great souls who simply have been sent by the Lord and to purify the world. So we're in the midst of a very interesting time in the history of the world where there's a great struggle towards, you know, bringing back the world towards godliness. And this ISKCON movement, as Srila Prabhupada writes in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, is one of the major branches of Lord Chaitanya's movement. And what is that branch? It's one of the key forces which is about is is destined to make a change in this world there are other groups too but particularly because Srila Prabhupada is a pure devotee of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he's teaching only pure devotional service and we are his followers so we are directly involved with the what we say bringing about the Yuga Dharma bringing about the propagation of religious principles in this particular age. So, going back in time, we see that the world many times has been very much overburdened with irreligion. And in the past, <laughs> the Lord has come in various incarnations of himself. And this particular incarnation, as Srila Prabhupada said, Ramadi Morti Sukala Niyamena Tishta Nana Vatara Akaro Bhuvanesha Kinchu Krishna Swayam Samabhavat Paramam Pamanyo Govindam Adipurusham Tamaham Bajami. Prabhupada quotes this verse Ramadi, r Ramadi, not just Rama, but Adi. That means Ram and all the other incarnations of the Lord are also manifestations of the original incarnation, or original personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. Sometimes this is misunderstood in spiritual circles and religious circles, and that Ram is, you know, distinct from Krishna, or Krishna is an incarnation of Ram, or Ram is, uh, you know, Shiva is the supreme and Ram is an incarnation of Shiva. There's so many, what we say, misunderstandings of the actual uh, character and mission and identity of Sri Ramchandra. And so this verse from Brahma Samhita spoke by Lord Brahma, which is the greatest authority within our Sampradaya, is that he is the main manifestation of all the incarnations of Krishna. Out of all of the innumerable, unlimited incarnations of Krishna, Ram is first. Mm -hmm. So Ram, Ram Adi means Ram and the others. Mm -hmm. So he's given particular distinction as, an, as a key incarnation of the Lord. And within the realm of spiritual existence, we have two levels of existence. We have Vrindavan Dham, where Krishna and his uh, cowherd friends and his, all his internal associates, they worship Krishna in the mood of Krishna being their friend, their perfect lover, uh, their son. In other words, Krishna is not worshipped in the highest form of spiritual existence as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He's worshipped only as the best of all personalities and the most lovable object. <laughs> and the, the residents of Sri Vrindavan Dham are not interested in, in hearing about Krishna as being God. <laughs> 
And when they tell him that, they simply dismiss it and worship him as their naughty child or their best friend or the best of all lovers. <laughs> so this is the highest realm of spiritual existence, and this is what Lord Chaitanya is teaching us. But below that is the Vaikuntha realm, and there are unlimited, innumerable, uncountable planets in the Vaikuntha world, and the topmost and highest and most spiritual of all in terms of the shakti that it, it carries is that Sri Ramchandra. So out of all the manifestations of the, uh, what we say, Narayan incarnations, Vishnu incarnations of the Lord, Sri Ram is the, is the principal one. So everything is done in gradations. So if you go below uh, Sri Vrindavan Dham, the first manifestation of Vaikuntha level is the abode of Sri Ram, Ayodhya Dham, in the spiritual world. This is just to illustrate the importance of our worshiping Sri Ram Chandra. And if you examine the present situation in the world today, those who worship in the Vedic culture, we find that if you compare the worship in terms of numbers that are actually worshiping the Lord, you find that the most numerous one is Sri Ram, <laughs> more than Krishna. Why? Because Krishna is too hard to understand. <laughs> and too hard to come to that level of pure devotional service for others. Therefore, and Krishna, when he comes to the planet, he says them something and he does something different. So people don't, they're not sure if they can trust him or not. <laughs> he says, uh, he comes to the battlefield and says, I'm not gonna fight, but he fights. <laughs> you know, He tells the gopis something and he does something different. <laughs> And his cane is crooked, so give you an indication of how he thinks. <laughs> he makes that cane crooked just to let you know. <laughs> but if we take it that way, then we are in an illusion because Krishna, he follows no rules. He follows no regulations. He follows, he follows what he wants to follow. And because he's the supreme, all-good personality of Godhead, even though we don't understand it, it's actually the highest form of spiritual understanding and worship. But Krishna is hard to really. That's why there's, and that's why. But people like Ram because Ram is righteous. He's moral. He's religious. He follows religious principles to the T, and he is the best of all personalities coming in the human form. He's the ideal person to learn from. We can learn so many things from the Ramayana. And uh, we've been already trying to bring some of those essential teachings from these particular pastimes. Yesterday we spoke about the love between uh, Ram and his brother Bart and how there were so many reasons why not to love each other they pushed all that aside in their love. It was love trying to conquer love. <laughs> Who can be the best to show love? And Ram won. He never loses. <laughs> he never loses. So, and if also we spoke about uh, when people somehow mistakenly judge another person, it causes havoc in the life of each of the individuals. Judging without understanding or mis misjudging. Two very iris, when we say, e very close loving brothers, Vali and Sugriva. A little misunderstanding, jumping into conclusions, all of a sudden the whole situation changes. They become the worst of all enemies. Hmm. We'll speak a little bit about that in another particular pastime about the misunderstanding between Sita and Lakshman, which is really a fundamental principle of, to understand how, I don't want to get into that 
at this particular point in the lecture, we'll speak about that later, but how words can really destroy relationships. <laughs> words that are not meant to destroy relationships, but spoken out of tension rather than right intention. Right intention is there, but it's mixed with intention. The tongue wins over the mind. <laughs> it happens all the time. Well, that's a nice lesson from the Ramayan. Two very, what we say, inseparable personalities who are so close to each other in loving relationships, in the mood of respecting each other in that relationship, all of a sudden have a, a tremendous argument and disagreement. So we can see these things and how to avoid them. But I want to begin simply by narrating a little bit about the appearance of Lord Ram. Because the appearance of Lord Ram is quite interesting in the sense that it shows the, uh, well there's many reasons why the Lord appears of course, we mentioned one of them. But there are many, many other deeper reasons. And uh, apparently it was due to finding an heir to a very successful kingdom on earth, Ayodhya Dham. Ayodhya Dham was 96 miles in length and 24 miles in width. It was a big city. <laughs> and it had hundreds and hundreds and thousands, maybe even millions of inhabitants. And every one of those inhabitants were God-conscious, religious, moral. The city flourishes as practically on the level of the heavenly realm. Everything was ideal. No one was in poverty. The citizens enjoyed all the luxuries and needs that they could possibly, you know, use in a lifetime. Everything was nice. Everyone was working according to their dharma, their occupational nature. And if there was any outside enemies, it was immediately destroyed by the power of their unity and by the power of the leadership that they, they had. And what was that leadership? A great king called Dasarat. His name, Das Arath, means ten chariots. He was such an amazing fighter that he could fight with ten persons in, on, on chariots at the same time and defeat them. It's inconceivable from our perspective. Sometimes we see some cartoons on the, and it looks quite fantastic. <laughs> And we get a little idea from this Im imaginary world of, you know, fairy tales. But actually these things are not something that is created by someone's mind. And you know, that people were so qualified. Because as the ages go, come closer and closer to Kali, and then eventually as Kali Yuga progresses, people are more, less and less qualified in every aspect of life, not only spiritually, but also materially. Also materially. To make electronic gadgets, Prabhupada said that's sutra work. <laughs> Everyone is thinking, oh, it's so much technology. But Prabhupada says, it's just sutra. It's just manipulating the material energy, that's all. Real. You know, advancement of a society is the qualities of the three higher orders which provide the necessities and the direction and administration of the society. And what do you see in our society? Is there any Brahmins? <laughs> I mean outside of the religious groups in the, in the society itself. If somebody can tell two people how to love each other better, he's considered a, gu a guru, you know. That's today's society, <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, what is glorified in, in Kali Yuga is things that are, you know, more like animal propensities. How to eat better, how to sleep better, how to, you know, how to wake up better, <laughs> how to, you know, how to, you know, 
keep your health together, which is, if you live a normal life, it's not a problem. <laughs> but because we don't live a normal life in this society, and the technology is destroying everybody, and then they have all these people teaching you how to become healthy at the same time. <laughs> you can see our society is all screwed up, to use a very, you know, you know, vernacular terminology. So, yeah, this is the situation in the world today. And so, therefore, but if you, you know, go back two million years, this is the, actually the appearance of Ram was two million years ago in the Treta Yuga. At the beginning of the Treta Yuga, the Lord appeared. And uh, so people were highly qualified. Even they had some really powerful demons who were mystic yogis who could disappear and appear. Look at Ravana. He was so powerful. He was intelligent. His father was Vishwarava, one of the greatest of all Brahmins. His mother was a demon. That's how he became a demon. It says that the, the son takes on the qualities of the mother, the daughter takes on the qualities of the father, generally. <laughs> I'm not gonna say, that's not an absolute principle. But that's generally the case. That is generally the case. And so, you know, Ravana, his father was a great sage, Vishwarava. But he had also, he had also had a brother named Vibhishan, who was a great personality also. But still, he had his mother's characteristics. <laughs> and then he followed that and became not only a demon, but one who was actually causing havoc all over the world at the time. And but there was this other kingdom, Ayodhyadam. But there was one thing missing. Everything was perfect. Now, Dasara, he decides to make some uh, confession. He calls all the important people from all the areas of society for a huge conference. It's all his ministers are there, all the, you know, the, the army leaders, everyone who has some responsibility in society, huge assembly. He appears within the assembly. Everybody is wondering what Dasarath is going to say. And he walks in, he's got his sword on his side, and he's a powerful, powerful king. He's elderly, but still, it didn't affect the fact that he was still very powerful. He comes and he walks in very regally, respecting everyone, honoring everyone, acknowledging everyone's presence. They all acknowledge his presence. They all stand in honor of him. He takes the throne. And now he's looking at everyone how to explain what he wants to explain. It's not good news. What is that news? He is not happy. He has everything except one thing. Because it's a duty of a king to arrange for the heir of the throne. He's about to retire. He's no longer feeling the need to take that position. He needs a, a son. And he had how many wives? I mean, there's different versions of the Ramayan, but if you go to Valmiki Ramayan, you find he had 353 wives. <laughs> we mentioned that yesterday. Why so many wives? Three wives were, were, were what we say the prominent ones, the main ones, that was Koshaya, Kaikeyi, and Sumitra. But there was another personality on the planet at that time. Who was that? Parasaram. And Parasaram was a manifestation, or actually an incarnation of the Lord. And he, his service was to destroy or rectify the lives of the Kshatriya kings who were leading the world but not qualified to lead. Why? They were proud. Prabhupada explains this element of pride. Pride causes one to make so many mistakes. When a person becomes proud for whatever reason, 
because of position, intelligence, bodily beauty, or for whatever, carry, or even by certain accomplishments that they may have done, whatever reason, pride. And when that pride grows, then it causes problems for those who are with them or working with them. Why? Because they think, I am okay. I am great. I am successful. You have to listen to me. And pride causes one to make mistakes by treating others in a lesser position. Seeing others as simply instruments for one's own, what we say, success and gratification in life, and not appreciating others for whatever qualities and what we say achievements they may have. And if they do it, it's simply pretense. So the royal, a lot of places within the world were had these kings who were very successful but very proud and became a burden. And so the Lord came in the form of Parasaram. And he didn't like Kshatriyas. <laughs> he didn't like Kshatriya. His father, his father was Jamadagni. And Jamadagni was killed by, um, what is his name? He had so many arms. Ar Arjuna something, something Arjuna. Kartavarya Arjuna. Kartav Kartavarya Arjuna was such a powerful soldier that one day he decided to hold the river back while he was taking a bath. He had a thousand arms. And Ravana was bathing upstream. And when the river was not flowing, Ravana got really angry to find out what happened. And he came and he, he, he attacked Kartavari Arjuna. And Kartavari Arjuna just picked him up like a little puppet and threw him, you know, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> he was a powerful Shadri. Really powerful. But... You know, he also caused the death of uh, Parasaram's father, Jamadagni. That's a whole other story. It's mentioned in the ninth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. And then, so, that was another reason why Parasaram didn't like Kshatriyas. Didn't like Kshatriyas. His father was a Brahmin. And, but he also, in general, and so he would go around finding Kshatriyas and just dispatching him to Yamaraj. <laughs> that was his service. <laughs> Yamaraj was, you know, getting extra and safer. <laughs> so this was going on, but he had some conditions that if a Kshatriya was getting married, he would not disturb that Kshatriya. So, you know, Dasarad had good, what we say, logistics, and the word was always out that if Parasaram's in the area, he's going to get married again. <laughs> so in order to keep his, from being attacked by Parasaram, he got married 350 times. Because, <laughs> you know, Parasaram was, this is explained in Ramayana. Yeah. And so that's how he had so many wives. But they were just really not even considered to be wives. They were just there because they had been able to protect him during the time that... But he was focusing on mostly his three main wives, Koshaya, Kaikeyi, and Sumitra. And now he's sitting in front of this huge assembly and he gives his reason for calling the assembly. There is no heir to the throne. In all our attempts to bring about an heir, nothing has happened. There has no been no, no issue coming. I am unhappy. I don't know what to do. Please give some advice. There was one sage there. His name was Vashishta. Vashishta knew because he heard from Sanat Kumara, the four Kumaras. It's not. Yeah, it was Sanat Kumar, out of the four Kumars, one is named Sanat Kumar, that there will be a personality who will appear in this dynasty of Dasarat who will be a great personality and will rule the world as the successor of Dasarat. 
Nobody knew that except Vashishta. Vashishta, when he heard what happened in the assembly, he made that declaration. When Dasarat heard that, although he didn't become completely happy, he became hopeful. He believed it, but at the same time, he wanted something quick. <laughs> he was thinking, we want to bring that personality. How to do that? There is no one who could perform that sacrifice to bring that. Is there anybody on earth? Vashishta says, there is one person. You have to bring that person here. Only he can perform the sacrifice. No one else is qualified. Who is that person? After the, he gives his talk in the assembly, he consults with his ministers. This is the business of a kshatriya, not to simply make decisions on their own. It's explained in the scriptures there are three kinds of leaders. There's one leader who takes advice from, from what we say wise counsel and carries out that advice. There's a second kind of leader who goes to the council, gets their advice, and decides whether to take it or not. And there's a third, doesn't ask anyone. <laughs> Just, I mean, nowadays we find that, you know, because I'm the leader, whatever I say, it's all right. They don't take it away. Or maybe they do from certain persons who are like them. Ravana was the second one. He would get advice from his, from his ministers, but he would judge whether he thought it was good or not. <laughs> that was Ravana. But Dasarat, he wanted to know how to bring that heir to the throne. There was one person. And then it was explained, do you remember? There is a kingdom not far from here. I can't remember the name of the kingdom, but the name of the king was Romapad Maharaj. And he was ruling this kingdom. And there was many, many, many years ago, Dasarat had one child. It was a girl. Her name was Shanta. And Romapad had, he also had no issues. So Dasarath was a good friend with Romapad, so he gave him his daughter as a gift, so Romapad would have a child. So that was, so Shanta was living in the kingdom of Romapad. And many, many years ago, that kingdom had a complete drought. There was no water for, for years. And Romapad was, the whole king, he didn't know what to do. But there was one person who could make the difference. He was living in the forest. His name was Rishishringa. Rishishringa was a son of Vibanda, Kibanda, I think it's Vibanda, Vibanda. Hmm. Vibanda, yeah, Vibanda. And Vibanda had this boy as his son. Now the boy was he had these horns that would come out of his head. So that's what he got the name Rishishringa. It means one who has horns from their head. It was you. Now, Vibanda didn't want his son to have any exposure to anything outside other than living in the forest as a hermit. He never saw the opposite sex. Never in his whole life. Now he was now he now he's 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 somewhat grown up. His father kept him like that. And that was, but one day when that kingdom of Romapad was so, I mean, was actually getting to the point where if they didn't have water, I mean, people would be dying because there would no there was no crops to be able to grow. So the ministers told the Romapad that in that jungle there is. Rishishringa, and only he can bring about, he can change this drought, no one else. So, but Vibanda was protecting him. He didn't want anything, you know. So, and Rishishringa, he was happy, you know, 
living a life of, you know, a renunciate, living in the forest. Take his father took care of him nicely. He would do his pujas, he would do his mantras, he would do his yahomas and his various yagyas. And so, but there was a need. So Romapad decided, among with, along with his ministers, to try to bring Rishishringa to the kingdom. Because they said, if you can bring Rishishringa to the kingdom and marry him with your daughter, Shanta, then together they perform the sacrifice and then there will be rain. How to get Rishishringa to the kingdom? This is a very good brahmachari story. <laughs> Any brahmacharis here? <laughs> There's a few. <laughs> Maybe you're all brahmacharis, but <laughs> or brahmacharinis. <laughs> and then, you know, you can we can extend that definition and to mean different things. <laughs> it means one who follows very strictly their ashram. We could use that definition too. So even in the Grihastha ashram, one can have those qualities if they follow very, very carefully that ashram accordingly. So the plot was to take these ladies and dress them up as men and carry with them all kinds of nice gifts, and especially sweets. So they had these three ladies with baskets of sweets and flowers and dressed up like, no, they weren't, I'm sorry, they weren't dressed up as men, they were ladies. They were actually coming as ladies. Now they knew they couldn't go there if Vibhanga was there. So they waited just at the right time when he left to, go, to gather some food for, for his ashram. And then they came. And they start singing very sweetly to Rishi Shringa. So many nice songs glorifying the Lord and glorifying, you know, higher religious and moral principles. And Rishi Shringa, he was thinking, hmm, these are strange looking men. They're not, they have a different shape. <laughs> So he, he was looking at them because he never saw a woman in his whole life. And his father never told him about that. <laughs> and so he's looking. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're coming close to him and, and you know, they smell good. <laughs> and he, they're offering him these nice gifts that they brought with him and smiling at him and singing. And he, all of a sudden he's feeling like, Something's changing in me. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but I'm not sure how to, how to deal with it either. <laughs> so, so this was going on. And, uh, you know, and then his mind actually became quite, we might use the word in a loose way, disturbed. And then these ladies left. And then, but that disturbance wasn't something negative, it was something positive. He was attracted. He couldn't understand why he was attracted, but he was attracted. <laughs> Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> you know, it happens. <laughs> Prabhupada said, you know, your love for Krishna is like the natural love between man and woman. <laughs> he would use that example because he would say, no one has to teach that, that quality. You know, you grow up and you just look at the other side and there's an attraction, right? It's just normal. That's just the way it is in the material sense. Prabhupada would use that example in terms of our relationship with Krishna. So in the same way, of course that's material and temporary, where our relationship with Krishna is eternal and, uh, you know, uh, spiritual. So now, he, he's n he wants to meet those ladies again. <laughs> and he's not, so he waits again when his father leaves, and then he leaves his ashram. And, uh, that he finds, he actually goes to the kingdom of Romapad because the girls invited him to come also. He said, you know, come and see us, you know, and we'll, you know, we'll give you some more nice sweets and sing to you and so many nice things. Love. <laughs> <laughs> you heard about it, right? <laughs> okay. So, 
you know, I have to act according to my ashram, so please don't condemn me. <laughs> At least right now, anyway. So, <laughs> he's, uh, you know, so he, he actually comes, and then when he comes to the kingdom, you know, he, he meets the girls again, and then he's attracted. And so he gets married to Shanta, and then Romapard performs a sacrifice, and the rains come. And then the drought, which was years, mentions in the, in the Ramaya, that drought was for years, and it was so, it was getting critical, very critical. Everyone was suffering. So now these profuse rains. So Vashishta says, if you want to have someone who is qualified, there's only one qualified, that is Risha Shringa. You have to bring him here. So, and go to Romapod, because Romapod is your friend. You're, you, his daughter is actually your daughter, and so Risha Shringa is actually your son-in-law. So Dasarat, his ministers, they come, they ask Romapad, Romapad immediately agrees, Risha Shringa comes to the assembly. Now, before performing this great yagya, which is going to be done in order to bring about children, uh, he has to establish unrivaled supremacy around the world. So, for one year, they have to send what is called the uh, it's called the, it's a horse. They have to perform the Asma Meda Yagya. It's the Asma Meda Yagya. It's a, called the challenge horse. So Dasaras armies follow this horse, and this horse goes from kingdom to kingdom. And anyone who doesn't accept the supremacy of Dasarat as king of the world will have to challenge his armies. And if they just welcome the horse and offer their respects and honors to the army and the horse, the horse goes to the next king. So this goes on for a year. So one year, that horse traveled everywhere, and nowhere did anyone, you know, try to stop the horse. And then the horse comes, and then there's a sacrifice performed, and the horse is giving a new body, and then that horse actually becomes a great personality in its next life. So, and then after successfully performing the Asmameda Yagya, now they're ready to perform this Yagya to bring about the birth of a great personality. So Risha Shringa is there, and he's doing the Yagya. And uh, in the Yagya <laughs> ceremony, everyone is really like, we can't really wait for the results. Finally, during the yagya, when it's going on and there's prayers and the fire sacrifice is there, the brahmins are chanting the mantras. It says that if the brahmins are not qualified and they chant one syllable of the mantra wrong, you get a different result in the yagya. We have the example of, uh, what was his name, that big demon. Vitrasura, yeah, Vitrasura. Yeah, yoga, uh, Indra, was it not Yendra, but who was that personality? Um, he had three heads. And Indra cut off his heads, and his, his son, Vishwarupa, yeah, Vishwarupa, yeah. What was his father's name? can't remember. Anyway, he performed a sacrifice to get a, a demon to kill Indra. But when the sacrifice was performed, instead of using a long A, they used a short A. Because you see in the Vedic, in the, in the Sanskrit syllables, there's an emphasis over some of the syllables, and that has to be, the sound has to be pronou pronounced properly. Just like when we say, uh, just like if you say Krishna, that's Draupadi, or that's actually the goddess of fortune. It's Krishna. If you say Rama, it's actually 
Ram, Rama Devi. It's because it's Rama, Rama. So it's not, the emphasis is on certain syllables. So if it's pronounced wrong, it's like Prabhupada would also chastise us for chanting the words wrong. He would say, Every day you are singing the prayers to the spiritual master, but please don't call your spiritual master a cow. <laughs> Sri Guru Charana Padma, was he? Bande Guru Sri Charanaravindam. <laughs> it's Bande Guru, Guru, not Guru. See, if you say Guru, that's a cow, and you say Guru, so Prabhupada. I know what you mean, but please still, do not call your spiritual master a cow. <laughs> I mean, we do that all the time. We say, you know, two lassi, give me two lassies, not one, but two. <laughs> so it's, tu it's tulasi, the emphasis is on the I, so it's tulasi, tu tulasi. Or Tulsi, that's easier. You can't make a mistake with that one. <laughs> you know, so we, we have a tendency to really, I mean, it's the Western, you know, training or not lack of training. So I went now, and just to divert for a second, the GBC has made a, a GBC regulation. You guys got to get it right now. We've been around for a while. <laughs> so, you know, after, you know, 50 years, please <laughs> get it right. Hare Haraya, Namba Krishna Yadavaya Namaha. All glories to Lord Shiva. <laughs> Hare, Hare Hara, Hara, Hare Haraya, Hara. No, I can't Hare Haraye. If you don't say, if you say Hare Haraya, Instead of Haraye, you're saying Shiva. <laughs> that's all right. I mean, that's not so bad. <laughs> but that's not the intention of the, the bhajan. So, yeah, so one, the mantras were chanted so perfectly lettered by the Brahmins, and if the, any syllable was off, the whole yagya was spoiled. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? You know, we do yagyas, Prabhupada said, if you just chant Hare Krishna, and then all the mistakes are okay, you know. <laughs> then Krishna somehow or other. Therefore, the holy name can nullify all of our inabilities to chant these mantras properly. But that's not, you know, a you know, default method. It's not new, it's not accepted like that. Anyway, they chanted the mantras, and the mantras were so perfectly chanted by the Brahmins, and Rishasringa was just the ideal Brahmin. I mean, he was perfect in all respects. And then, out of the fire comes this big black personality, and he's got this big golden pot in his hand, and he, he emerges from the fire, and everyone sees his personality. And then he takes the pot and he places the pot down and merges back into the fire again. Really, it was amazing how they could bring great personalities right out of the fire in their yagyas. Imagine how pure the, the yagyas were. Amazing. And so in that part was, what what is it called? Hy hyacin or some? Piacin, piacin. It is a very special preparation that comes uh, out of fire yagyas. And it's, it looks like sweet rice, but you can't call it sweet rice. It's, it's actually rice and milk together. And this was the elixir that was going to bring about the conception of the queens in order to bring the personalities there. So Dasarat. After the yagya was over, he receives this piyasin, and now he's thinking how to distribute it. So he takes, he takes one half, he divides it into a half, and gives half to his main queen, Koshalya. And then he takes the other half and divides that into half, and gives one quarter of that half to Kaikei. And then he takes that other half, which is a quarter now, and divides that again and gives it one part of that to Sumitra. And then we heard also 
how Garuda, the altar, now the altar was shaped, I, have it, let's see, I got it written here, the altar was actually shaped like an eagle with an image of Garuda on the altar. So Garuda was personally present, and we heard from uh, Janaki Nath Prabhu yesterday how Garuda actually appeared, and grabbed that last portion, and flew away to Kishkinda Mountain, dropped that portion on this great personality, Anjani, Anjani who was performing great, great sacrifices in order to receive a son. So the birth of Hanuman is actually, Hanuman was actually Ram's brother <laughs> in that particular incarnation. Not in every incarnation. He appears in different ways. So now everything has been distributed. The queens are starting to show signs of child coming and everyone is getting happy. But... It wasn't, it took a little bit longer. Ram stayed in the womb for 12 months. <laughs> you know, he doesn't follow the rules like we, <laughs> he decided, he comes at the right time. And it's mentioned that he came on what is called Ram Navami or Nomi, Ram Nomi, which is the ninth day after the, uh, the moon, the full moon, like that. We mentioned yesterday, how, this is also mentioned in the Ramayana, how the number nine is very significant and Ram wanted to use that to glorify the number nine. Nine actually stands for, for righteousness, for success. And in mathematics, those of you who are, who are interested in math, if you take nine and you multiply it by one, you get nine. If you take nine, you multiply it by two, you get 18, eight and one is nine. And if you multiply three, you get 27. 22 and seven is nine. 36, 45, 54, 63. It's always the two numbers that you come up with the multiplication always add up to nine. You can just keep going. So Ram wanted to appear on the ninth moon, after, uh, the ninth day after the full moon, like that. So after some time, Four children appear from three mothers. From, Ra from Kosalia, Ram was born. From Kaikei, Bart was born. And from Sumitra, who had received two portions, two children were born, and that was Satrugna and Lakshman. That was Satrugna and Lakshman. And they paired off in brothers, in, in, in association. And this is a little fast forward. La Ram, Lakshman was attracted to Ram. And Sitrugna was also attracted to Ram. But Sitrugna, the name Sitrugna is interesting because it means, let me see here, it means one who conquers his enemies. So how does that relate to the pairing off of the brothers? He was known to kill one demon called Lomasa. It was a very ferocious demon. No one could kill it. But that's not why he's given that name. He's given the name, why? Because he had this strong, strong, strong desire to be with Ram. But he knew it wasn't his destiny. In other words, he understood it wasn't meant to be. And Lakshman was with Ram and he went with Bart. So why is he called the one who conquers his enemy? Because his enemy was his attraction for Ram. In the sense that that's what he wanted. But he gave that up in order to become the servant of the servant of Ram. So to become the associate of the Lord is glorious, but to become the servant of the servant of the Lord's associates is even more glorious. So he's known for his humility, Sitrugna. That was his outstanding quality. Bart, the name Bart means one who bears a heavy burden. And what did we, uh, we heard 
just yesterday and how he had to accept criticism from all the citizens before be be uh, implicated in his mother's what we say program to make him the king and so many he was misunderstood and yet he never never complained about what's happening to him his only concern was to bring Ram back and have him uh, rule the kingdom so the word Bart means one who bears heavy burdens so watch if you name your child that you can expect certain things may happen <laughs> It's true. Yeah. They say if you name a girl according to a river, Kalindi or Saraswati, you can expect that she will be going everywhere. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I mean, you better be careful with names because they actually have meanings attached to them. <laughs> One devotee, he wanted to name his son a particular name. And I knew if he gave him that name, the kid would be a rascal. <laughs> so, but you know, he, he said to me, Guru Maharaj, give my name, give a, son, a name to my son, but this is the name I want. <laughs> I said, uh, give me a few names and I'll, I'll let you choose from one of the ones uh, that, you, that uh, you know, now give me a few, uh, I'll give you a few names and you choose, you know. No, that's not right. Give me, a, you know, <laughs> give me a few names, and I'll choose one of them. Yeah, that was it. He said, well, I only have one choice, so. <laughs> so I said, okay, it's your choice. <laughs> but don't ask me for the next kid. You know, cause <laughs> I mean, if you're going to ask me to give a name, you know, it's just like, okay. I'm willing to, you know do it, but if you want me to give it to just bless you with the name you want, <laughs> then why even ask me? <laughs> so he named him a particular name. I won't mention the name <laughs> because there's some people in this audience who have names like that. So, <laughs> so if you want to know, you can talk to me later. <laughs> It's a nice name. <laughs> so yeah, names also have certain, you know, characteristics and that connected with the name like that. So And Lakshman means oh, let me see what I wrote it down here. Lakshman means wealth or or serve that wealth that is the service to the supreme personality of Godhead. That wealth, that is a service. So, and Ra Ram means one who gives pleasure to everyone. Rama, Rameti, or Ram, Rama, means one whose life is simply for the pleasure of others. <laughs> and we see, Ram did that. Everyone he met, everyone loved him. And even when he killed the demons, you know, he, he even they got the best possible results of their life being killed by the Supreme Person. So Ram was all auspicious. Like that. So now these four children are growing up and they're a little mischievous. <laughs> Ram was never like that, but only one time did he perform mischief to someone. He would never cause anyone any difficulty. One time, he took him and his brother Lakshman, they had this, I don't know what it was, but it was something, it was filled with water and they threw it at Mantara. <laughs> you heard about that. And she didn't like it and she got hit with it and they all started to laugh. That was the only time. So Mantara never liked Ram. <laughs> And we also understand that she was the person who instigated Kaikeyi against Ram by poisoning her with this idea that Ram is actually, you know, against your brother and therefore he's not even qualified to lead. Therefore, your brother should be the, the, the personality to rule Ayodhya. So, but that was just one childish mischief. Say, oh, they grew up together as best of friends 
And they paired off in their relationships and they were close to each other like that. Ram is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Sometimes he is understood to be Narayan. And uh, within the Chatur Vyuhar there is Narayan, uh, what we say, uh, Pradyumna, Aniruddha, and Sankarshan. And Lakshman is Shankarshan. Uh, Satrugna, I think, is Aniruddha, and uh, and Bart is Pradyumna. So we have the manifestations of the Chaturvyuya, one of the original incarnations of the Lord coming f from the Narayan manifestation, as m now manifested in this material world as Lakshman. Lakshman, Bart, Satrugna, and Sri Ram. So now they appeared in the world like that. So what are some of the reasons why the Lord appeared? There was actually four reasons given in the Ramayana. One is to kill Ravana. <laughs> the demigods had petitioned Lord Brahma that this Ravana is causing so much havoc. You gave him all these boons, and now he's, <laughs> he's using the boons against us. <laughs> you know, Brahma, you know, when Brahma did that to Harani Kashipu, the Lord told him, hey, you know, why are you causing so many problems? You and Shiva, you know, you're always getting me in trouble. Because <laughs> the demigods, especially these two powerful demigods, what was their service? Their service is to accept austerities that are given by persons and grant material benedictions. But they're supposed to discriminate, but sometimes they don't discriminate. So, you know, Ravana performed so many austerities, and when... When, uh, when Brahma came, he said, what do you want? He said, I, I want to be free from death. And then he named all kinds of categories. But then he thought, humans? Yeah, they're just so puny. I don't even, don't even, you're insulting me if you give me that benediction to be killed from, not be killed by humans. That's why the Lord appeared as the best of all humans. And then his brother, Kubakarna, he was just as, you know, he was also performing austerities too. And uh, he was even more powerful than Ravana. And then when it came to giving him benedictions, the demigod said, oh no, man, no, not that guy. He's too much. And uh, so they, they made a plan, Lakshmi, do something. <laughs> No, Saraswati, do something. Saraswati, do something. So when uh, when uh, Kubalkarna was asking for his benedictions, he he uh, he said, "I want to." And then Saraswati jumped in there and said, "Sleep." <laughs> <laughs> and she peered on his tongue, and he said it. And, and Brahma went, "Tatastu." <laughs> you said it. <laughs> We give you that benediction. And so, therefore, he was only allowed. But then, uh, you know, his brother said, you know, well, what is this? And he's got the benediction of sleeping. You have to do something. All right, so they said, we'll make some adjustment. He can come, he can, he can appear one day a year and wake up, and then he can eat and then go back to sleep again. <laughs> So for some people, that sounds pretty good, right? <laughs> Not devotees, of course. Of course, if you go into certain brahmachari ashrams, you might get a little experience of that mood of kupakarna. But, <laughs> but that's another subject. <laughs> anyway, so, yeah. Uh, so and then of course Vibhishan he also got the benedictions that he wanted to worship the supreme personality of Godhead, and uh, Suparnaka she also received benedictions. So they all got benedictions from from Lord Brahma. So the demigods are now you know upset because the, these benedictions are causing so many problems. So Brahma goes to the milk ocean and petitions the Lord, and the Lord says, "I will come." But I will also come along with the demigods, and the demigods will appear in a different form, and they will be known as half sapient and half samian, half monkey and half man. 
So they are actually all all the dem all the uh, the monkey soldiers are actually demigods who appeared in monkey forms. They had some of the characteristics of both, but mostly the characteristic of the demigod. But they also had this monkey-like tendency too. So they appear as a race on the earth called the Varners. The Varna, the word Varna means, is it human? It's a question mark. Is it human? But they were actually powerful personalities. So this is a little bit about the appearance of the Lord. Some of the other reasons is to protect the devotees from the demons. We also know that that was the second reason. The third reason is not so much known. The third reason is not so much known. It's an interesting reason why the Lord appeared, and it was to simply satisfy Lakshmi Devi. Lakshmi Devi, the Lord is always being surrounded by his devotees, and Lakshmi doesn't have any private time with her husband. So we know the pastime, when Brahm was requested to go to the forest for 14 years, his, his beautiful consort, Sita Devi, she says, I want to go with you. He said to her, you can't go in with me. The forest is so dangerous. It's cold. It's dark. What will you eat? How will you live? You're accustomed to luxury, palaces, fine food, servants. None of that is there in the forest, and it's, there's rakshasas. It's very dangerous. She said the most amazing thing. This is very interesting. Mm -hmm. it's, it's good marriage counseling. We got <laughs> for those of you who want to need some marriage counseling points. She said that Iodia without you is like the forest, and the forest with you is like Iodia. Mm. Ram couldn't refuse. She was willing to take on the difficulties just to serve and be with her glorious husband. So she comes now. So this is one of the reasons why they had time together in the forest, Lakshmi and Ram, or Narayan and Narayan and Lakshmi. So in order to fulfill the desire of Lakshmi, the Lord also appeared and came to the forest just to satisfy her desire for association. And the fourth reason, I wrote it down. I'm still trying to understand what I wrote. <laughs> Maybe someone can help me. It says the Raghunath Didi and Ram and, the te and teaching how to worship because actually Raghunath, Ranganath, I'm sorry, not Raghunath, Ranganath, in South India, in the Sri Rangam temple, is actually non-different than Sri Ram. It's non-different than Sri Ram. So there's some connection between that particular deity. So he manifested himself as that deity, and he is also, he's in that reclining position as Narayan in the spiritual world. So let's mention as the fourth manifestation or reason for the appearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So I wanted to narrate a few other pastimes in, in the Ramayana to help us maybe learn some of the more important parts of uh, spiritual uh, knowledge that we can take along with us. But before I do that, is there any questions or comments? based on you know today's very glorious day to honor the supreme personality of god at sri ram any comments questions yes um uh, radhavi nodini Also, the other story when uh, uh, this uh, story of Bharat Maharaj and uh, the deer, and uh, is it the same personality or or different or what happened? What's the other pastime? Uh, the, yeah, the deer and well, what's the other one you referred to? Uh, 
the, uh, the other that um, that uh, Bharat is being uh, Lord Ramachandra's brother. Bharat is. Uh, or did I? I just when you didn't have the mic, I couldn't hear what you were oh. saying. Uh, it's just uh, that as I saw, this same name is there uh, for one uh, person as uh, Lord Ramachandra's brother. Bart. Uh, yes, and uh, for this past past time that uh, Bharat Maharaj and uh, the the deer. Oh. <laughs> so is it the same person? No, 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 <laughs> no, no, not at all. Uh, yes, it's <laughs> no uh, connection. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, then that was Bart. Mm, he was the son of Rishabdev who ruled the world, and the world became known as Bard Varsha after some time. Before that was Ilavati Varsha, and because his rule was so influential, the world's name was changed to Bard Varsha. But it's not the same personality. No. Okay, I, I was a bit confused by this. No, he's uh, he's the son of Rishabdev, and, but the Bard that appeared with Lord Ram is actually an incarnation of the, mm -hmm. the, the spiritual in Chatur Vyuhar, manifestation mm -hmm. of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Prabhu. Excuse me. Um, there's a lot of people who blaspheme against Rama for sending Sita into a second exile. After? After um, people start casting aspirations on her character for living in Ravana's palace for... Yeah. Oh, whether she was polluted by that. Yeah, but then a lot of people point fingers to Rama for sending her um, away after, after listening to the accusations that people make. Yeah. So what would you say to such people who say he's not Mariada Purushottam because he, on the say so of a few people, he abandoned his own wife who was pregnant? Hmm. Well, there's, there's, there's a reason why he did that. Hmm. And that's a long story. <laughs> real reason. If I had the n my notes in front of you, I could read it because it's it's about nine pages describing why he did it. <laughs> and uh, you know, I get this question a lot. <laughs> you know, and from especially from ladies. <laughs> you know, at Ram, mm -hmm. look what he did to his wife. <laughs> yeah. So how do we understand that? There was a reason behind that. And it has to do with two demons who performed austerities in order to get liberation. They wanted liberation without following the process of becoming liberated. And two demons. And they were granted that benediction with an exception. The exception was that, yeah, I can't remember all the details. I have it on my, I have it written down somewhere else. It's a really intricate story. But it's related to this particular pastime that in order to foil their demon, the demons wanted anyone that they didn't, you don't have to follow religious principles in order to get liberation. And they performed austerities to get that. In order to reverse the effects of that, Ram had a sensita away. So he apparently broke a religious principle in order to fulfill a higher religious principle. So uh, maybe later on, um, we c I can uh, read you that pastime because it's really, it's quite long. It's about nine full pages of how it all played out. But, you know, sometimes people say, well, why did Ram listen to this, uh, why should this person who was simply criticizing his wife? But he was playing the role of an ideal king. And therefore, a king should be above suspicion. He tested Sita, because even after she came back, after being in Lanka, and he rescued her, he refused to accept her. And he told Lakshman, to, you know, what was it, Lakshman or someone, to build a funeral py pyre. 
and he wouldn't even look at her. Now, you know, after this long, long separation, and he went through so much trouble to, f to get her back, he had to destroy a whole race of, you know, Rakshasas. Now she's <coughs> back. It appears that everything is wonderful. You read that section of the Ramayana, Ram is just like, he doesn't want to hear anything. He's just looking the other way. He's really stern. He's like in a different mood. And now he wants her to prove her, her, her chastity. And she said, oh, if that's the way it is. And she walked into the fire, and out of the fire came, the ad, ad came Sita, untouched by the fire. And it's proved that she was not and at least bit polluted by apparently being in Lanka, in not in the association, but in the proximity of Ravana. Because association actually means if you agree with the person, then you're in association. You can be with two. You can be in a in a room with so many people, but if you're in a different mindset, you're not in you're not in association. Association, Prabhupada said, means affection for. When you develop affection for materialists, you could you associate with them. You de develop affection for and service to devotees, then you're in association with devotees. You can be in a room full of devotees and not be in association of devotees if you're in a different consciousness. So association is a, is a state of consciousness, actually, or a mood like that. So she was never in that mood. And she came out pure. And the fire got Agni and showed and brought her out. And then Ram took her back. But then when he heard that criticism, but that same person, you know, he later appeared, the person who criticized his wife. His wife was out all night, and she came back. And he said, where were you? I didn't you, you were out all night. I don't know where you went. And now you're coming back. You think, I, you think I'm like Ram accepting my wife back after she's been with another, in another person? He said, I'm not like that. And he was exclaiming his morality that it was even better than Ram because Ram has accepted Sita back. And pe some people were thinking that Ram was actually uh, in the wrong mood. He was accepting his unchaste wife, but he wasn't. She was chaste. He made a mistake. That same person later took birth in, pro in Krishna's pastimes and was killed by Krishna. He was the washerman that refused to give Krishna the clothes. <laughs> when Krishna came to Mathura with Balaram and they came to this washerman, they saw these nice clothes. Krishna wanted the clothes. He said, you, who do you think you are? These clothes belong to the king. You'll be punished by the king. And Krishna just, poom. <laughs> That's why Krishna is hard to <laughs> really <laughs> he gets you know he gets right to the point. He, you know he wanted to you know do a little fashion show. He didn't want to waste time with this guy. <laughs> so <laughs> they just took the clothes and you know Krishna is perfect because he f because he is the supreme personality of Godhead and therefore everything he does is perfect. We just uh, we just don't understand it. So to understand Krishna means to to actually perfect your life. It's easier to understand Ram. That's why more people like the worship of Ram. <laughs> but Ram is glorious. He also does things that are hard to understand. But with a little investigation, you can understand why. There's always a reason why. And Krishna does it because he wants to. <laughs> Sometimes you talk to a person, why'd you do that? Because I want to. <laughs> why? Because I want to. <laughs> There's a certain quality about you that you like, that you want to do something, and you don't have to explain it. <laughs> if you always have to explain why you're doing that, you know, so sometimes it, you know, it's a problem. <laughs> and, and you have that. Per <laughs> People don't understand sometimes why we do what we do, and we don't have to make you know a declaration of the reasons why I do everything. You know, <laughs> you get to know the person, it becomes easier to understand. <laughs> But even that, I told this story yesterday, I won't tell it again and again about how husbands and wives misunderstand each other. 
And it's the misunderstanding that causes the break, not the actual situation. It's simply the misunderstanding. So, okay. Any other questions? Yes. Sri Devi. And then Tulsi Manjari next. Um, this uh, fourth reason for the appearance of the Lord as Lord Ranganath yeah. is that the murti that appeared after the Lord left the planet or he left, uh, he, he manifested as the murti even while he was present? Hmm. There are two different murtis. One of them is after he left and one was during he, the time he was there. There was one... There was that was that there was that story of that one Brahmana that was living in Ayodhya, and he would only take prasadam when he saw Ram. So every day he would come and see the Lord, and then he would eat his breakfast. But when Ram went traveling for a while, and then uh, this person was fasting because Ram wasn't there. So finally, Lakshman said to Ram, "This you have your really, well, d d really mm, devoted. He's really your devotee. He he will not take any food or even any water until he sees you. But now it's been a long time, and he's on practically on the verge of death. So Ram said, oh, "Okay." And so he manifested a deity of himself and said, give him that deity, and then he can, he can worship me every day in the form of it's non-different. So that deity was one that he, he manifested during the time when he was there. And later on, he man also manifested a deity of, and that was later manifested as a deity of himself. So I'm not sure if that's the Ranganath deity. You'd have to do a little research. On that one. Okay, Tulsi Manjari, yes. Thank you. You mentioned that uh, Ram, uh, Rama is appear uh, like human being, but uh, wha what is my question? Is what is different uh, between appearing uh, Krishna when? He was in Earth and uh, Ramayana. We know that there is uh, so much uh, uh, expansion and uh, uh, incarnation. What uh, is uh, different between sp this? Speak your, your question to Nita Kishori in Croatian, and then she can translate it. So you said that Lord Ramachandra appeared as a human being, as a person. Mm -hmm. And what's the difference between his appearance and Lord Krishna's appearance? Well, Krishna also appeared in his original form. So the original form of Krishna is the two-handed form of Krishna, of, the, of God, two-handed form of God. And uh, Ram appeared as a human being because he, uh, Ravana could only be killed by a human being. So in order to kill Ravana, he had to take that particular f form of the Lord. And the Lord appears as, you know, he appears as a, what are some of the, he appears as a boar, appears as a turtle, appears as a fish, appears in many, in, but in order to fulfill that, that benediction of and uh, of the demigods, he, he appeared as a, a human. So both are coming in that form. But Krishna's original form in the spiritual world is a two-handed form. So both appeared in the human, it call, we call it not human being, but human-like form. <laughs> human-like form, because although they appear in that form, they're not human. They're they're completely in what we say transcendental uh, existence. Their bodies are completely spiritual. <laughs> when you say human, you talk about a defect. The word human also has the connotation of being defective. So, but the Lord's form is not defective, <laughs> perfect. 
Yes, uh, Bhakti Gamya. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Um, so just to, just to um, like follow on from what you just said, so how is it that, because Lord Ram is the Supreme Personality, um, so how, and Ravana said he was only going to be, I mean, he didn't include um, the benediction of not being killed by humans. So how does Lord Ram actually count as a human if he's a Supreme Personality of Godhead? So it's um, because he appeared in that form. <laughs> okay. He appeared in a human-like form. So he's categorized in that way. But if you think his body is human, then there's where the problem is. Human-like form, but not human. Okay. So he appeared like everyone else. That's the whole point. Thank you. Um, mm. The other incarnations of the Lord, you see, you know, even the dwarf Brahman of Vamana Day, he came as a dwarf. But he still came in, a f you know, a two arms, two legs. But still the distinction was a dwarf. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I had one more question, which I... Sure, yes, yeah, please, yeah, please. Okay, so, um, so also there was, as I understand, there's a pastime where, um, so Love and Kush are obviously explaining um, basically the, the Ramayan right. and then Lord Ram's overhearing this. And right, then, right. as I understand, then Lord Ram wants to call Sita back. I don't know if that's, maybe I made a mistake. And then she, and then when she's in the assembly of Lord Ram, then she um, makes a prayer and then she's swallowed by Mother Bhumi instead of being with Lord Ram. And I just wondered why, I mean, I just wondered why that happened. It was time to wind up their pastimes. And that's mentioned. It was time for the pastime on earth to wind up. <laughs> so she appeared, you know, she again entered into the earth yeah, like that. That was the only reason that I know of. There may be other reasons why she, she disappeared in that particular way. But you have to understand, well, this is also connected with that pastime of banishing that Sita and Ram can never be separated therefore those demons those demons said yes the only way the benediction cannot be fulfilled if 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 God and his energies are never separated so therefore in order to destroy those demons he separated himself from that uh, from Lakshmi from Lakshmi Devi or Sita Devi in order to destroy that benediction given to the demons because the demons were propagating that that you don't have to follow religious principles you can get liberation anyway so in order to destroy that and they said the only condition is that Sita and Ram will never be separated and therefore they th were thinking how is it possible Sita and Ram could ever they never be separated so they used that as the only consideration and therefore in order to kill those demons he sent Sita away. That's the year now I, remember, I start to remember that, that pastime. Mm. Yeah. But it was time to wind up the pastimes. I don't know how long the Lord stayed after that, but not very long after that. Yes, another, any questions? Any more questions? Okay, I can, I'm gonna narrate one more pastime because we're supposed to go to 9.30, is that all right? Or should, or you wanna take a break, chant Hare Krishna and uh, relax and, or do you wanna hear more? More? Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll hear more. <laughs> so. Ram kills 14,000 soldiers single-handedly. <laughs> some of the best soldiers in, in Rava's army, said it by some of these best junior generals. What was the name? Three, three Shula, and Dushanam, and some other general. Single-handedly. Suparnika, she sees the whole thing. Sister of Ravana comes back to 
<laughs> Ram. One, actually one soldier got away. His name was, what was his name? Anyway, one soldier was not killed. He got away. He also came back and told the whole story to Ram. A Ravana. And then Suparnaka being thwarted by Lakshman and Ram, she became angry. She wanted some vengeance. So she went to her brother and said, you know, she describes the beauty of Sita and says, you know, this person's perfect for you. Ram gets all excited hearing, uh, Ravana gets all excited hearing about this um, personality who is so beautiful. He wants to add her to his you know, collection. <laughs> the six demons that manifested themselves were from the incarnations of Jaya and Vidai. We have Haranyaksha, Harani Kasipu, we have Ravana, Kupakarna, Shishupal, Dantavarka. Each of these six correlates with one of the six anarthas, or six, what we say, enemies. Lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride, envy. Okay? Want to do a little interaction? Okay. What, what does Haranyaksha represent? Who said? He said, Anger. he said greed? Greed, he's right. He was so greedy, he exploited the earth for all the gold, and the, the, uh, the earth fell from its orbit. He was a personification of greed. Haranyakashipu. Nobody said it yet. Pride. He was so proud that he was thinking, nobody's can kill me. And he used his pride to exploit everyone. Demon of pride. Kubukarna? Illusion. <laughs> <laughs> I can be happy by sleeping. <laughs> I go into illusion to experience happiness. <laughs> Kubakarna. Uh, Ravana? Lust. He was so lusty. His main queen, Mandodari, was so chaste and so faithful that she's glorified along with Lakshmi, Anasuya, and Sita, and others as being ideal in all womanly characteristics. And there's verses glorifying Mandodari. She was so faithful and chaste to Ravana. He had the best and he had many more other wives. What is the message? Lust is never satisfied. The more you try to f satisfy lust by feeding lust, it becomes like a raging fire. You have a fire, you put wood on the fire. When you put wood on the fire, what happens? The fire goes down. You feed your lust, you feel better for a while. But that fuel on the fire will just take a few minutes, and what does it do? It burns. And then the fire becomes stronger. So this is the understanding that by feeding lust, we're not actually conquering it. Therefore, one has to perform austerities. One has to perform austerities and turn lust into devotion. Like that. And so, yeah, so lust is never satisfied by feeding it. Uh, so the example is given how a devotee or works. And the example is a tiger. A tiger is in the cage. And the tiger is depending upon food coming. He's in the zoo. So someone doesn't feed the tiger for one day. What happens? The tiger becomes a little more ferocious. 
If it doesn't feed it again the second day, the ferocity of the Chaya tiger increases. And as long as it doesn't get fed, it reaches a certain level of ferocity. But after that, it becomes so weak, it turns into a big pussycat. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, a little message. Don't feed your lust. What happens? Get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And then after a while, it goes away. <laughs> Baba said, you got an itch. And you think, oh. He said, that's sex desire. You scratch it. Oh, it feels so good. Yeah. <laughs> but then, <laughs> then what happens? <laughs> it comes back and it's just as it's stronger the next time. So by performing these austerities and engaging in devotional service, we can change that, that itch into a, a pleasant, soothing ointment. <laughs> so the idea is don't feed it, and then eventually it goes away, but not immediately. So there's a little bit of that you know, transition period <laughs> we have to go through. And then gradually, as we increase in our Krishna consciousness, Visayam Vidivartante, Nirasya Dehinam, Vaso Varjam Vaso Pyas, Param Jiswa Nivartan, higher taste comes. When the higher taste comes, then one can give up the lower taste. Just as easy as one can give up, you know, whatever's in the bathroom after you have to take care of nature. <laughs> it's just flushed. No one thinks, oh, that's part of me. <laughs> I can't give it up. <laughs> oh. You know, <laughs> I'm losing part of my, you know, it's, a, it's an important part. <laughs> and Prabhupada tells you the, the story about association. You ever heard this story? Prabhupada laughed when he told this story. And it's a man, he goes to the, the woods and he, you know, he has to take care of nature. So it's in the morning. So he takes care of nature and he looks and he says, Oh, how nasty. And then the, uh, you know, the, the thing talks back to him. Hmm, last night I was a pakora, <laughs> and due to my association with you, <laughs> this is what I've become. <laughs> So don't think your association is so great. <laughs> Probably I like that one. <laughs> yeah, so uh, where were supposed to, I kind of lost my track now. <laughs> what was I talking about? <laughs> oh, six name. Okay, we got we got through lust. So lust is is eventually. Because what is lust? Lust is love of God that's directed away from Krishna. When that lust is again mm -hmm. directed towards Krishna in the form of devotional service, it retains its normal, natural, pure state of love of God. It's, that's why it, that's why lust is so powerful because it's just love of God transformed into a, the desire to enjoy separately from Krishna. That's why it's very powerful. Because it's actually our nature. And then the last two demons, we have Shishapal and Kulvakarna. What's left? Ang uh, which one? Shishapal is? Envy. envy. He was so envious of Krishna. He, when he was born, he had four arms. He was a great personality. He was Krishna's cousin. His mother took him to astrologer and said uh, she wanted to hear the, you know, about her baby. And the astrologer said, when he sees the person who will kill him, two of his arms will fall off. <laughs> so then, you know, M Mataji's there and she wants to have a birth ceremony for the child after one year. So she invites Krishna to come. Krishna says, I'm not coming. <laughs> 
you don't want me to come. She says, no, no, you, that's your cousin, then you should have to come. She's pleading. He said, all right, but you be prepared. <laughs> so and then when, when the baby sees Krishna, two of his arms fall off. And then her mother says, Krishna, you're going to be the cause of killing my child. He said, I don't want to, but he hates me. <laughs> he hates me, but I'll give him a benediction. He can blast me for 100 times, and if he doesn't go over 100, it's okay, and then he can start from zero again. I mean, without stopping. And so, But he can go 99 and then stop, take a break, and then start again from zero. But if he continues over a hundred times in a row, then no more benediction. <laughs> so, yeah, during the Raja Surya sacrifice, when Krishna was elected as the, the greatest of all personalities, uh, Shushapa was besides himself in anger and envy, and he just started blaspheming Krishna. And then he, he and Krishna's counting 94, <laughs> 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100. 101. Boom. <laughs> he gave him a haircut at a little bit lower than. <laughs> finished him off. So, yeah, uh, he, you know. And uh, so Krishna had to fulfill that. So he was the. He was so envious of Krishna. Uh, and Prabhupada says, somehow or other, you can dovetail these other qualities in Krishna consciousness, but envy, he says, Matsarya cannot be dovetailed. That has to be given up. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur says that of all of the six qualities, envy contains all of the other five bad qualities. Why? Because it's, the, it's that principle that has, has caused the jiva to fall to the material world. Envious of Krishna, and therefore we carry that, not we, but anyway, the principle is that People carry that towards each other, and no one's happy with each other because this and this element of envy. I'm not happy because you are you, <laughs> and I'm not happy because I'm not you. <laughs> or I'm not happy because I'm me, and I'm not. Ha and you're happy because you're you, and I'm not happy because you're happy about being you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it takes different forms. Or then it actually takes the form of, uh, did, you know, did, did anybody read that book by, um, uh, by Gorgopal? The Secrets of, the Mysteries of Life, The Secret Mysteries of Life. He tells one story about envy in there that's really powerful. A corporation, and this one person, he's working in a corporation, he's so good at his job, he's doing revolutionary work to bring new products on, and his co-workers get envious of him. They don't like it. So when he's out of his office, they go into his room and take his computer and delete stuff from his computer. Finally, at one point, they deleted all his information. <laughs> this is, you know, because, you know, you're successful and I'm not, I'm not happy because you're successful. That's envy. I want to be successful. But a devotee thinks, if another devotee gets the mercy of Krishna and does wonderful things, that's my happiness. That's bhakti. When we see someone else doing well and getting the mercy and getting what we say, certain accolades or benedictions that come with getting, getting the mercy, the devotee thinks, wonderful. We're on the same team. We're all trying to s serve Krishna. But this envy is very subtle when it comes out in different forms. So that was Shishupal. And the last one was Dantavarka. Krishna was on his way back to Vrindavan, knowing that the demons might attack the Vrindavan. So he was in a hurry. Dantavarka stopped him and challenged Krishna to a fight. Krishna just dispatched him real fast. He had, he had other business to go. <laughs> Dantavarka took out his club and hit Krishna in the chest, and nothing happened. And then Krishna knocked his club away and just punched him and finished him off. Boom! <laughs> 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 Gotta go. <laughs> so yeah, 
So Krishna's cool. He's really cool. <laughs> and and you know he's he's the coolest. <laughs> and Ram, he's righteous. <laughs> Can't call Ram cool because you know <laughs> he does all kinds of things. <laughs> Krishna does other things. You know, it's nice to be cool nowadays. <laughs> Madhana Swami was telling one story and I was sitting there how you know how language gets messed up sometimes or changed around so mm, this was in GEV and he was telling this one story where he just gave a lecture and at the end of the lecture one young man came up and said that was bad <laughs> and Mara said I'm sorry, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, you, you know, maybe uh, next time I'll try to do, <laughs> you know, he was very humble, mm. and the boy walks away, <laughs> and, and then he, later on, somebody must have informed him, and the boy came back, he said, no, no, I meant, you know, that was good, <laughs> 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 because the word bad now means, hey, man, that's bad. <laughs> 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 As bad. <laughs> I'm still left over from last night. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> we're still going. It's going to happen again tonight. <laughs> so, yeah, so how, you know, how things can get, words can also be changed around. So, Ram, Ravana, now he's angry. He, he wants to do something, and he's afraid to approach Ram directly. He's a little cautious, so he goes to Maricha. Maricha's retired. Maricha's living in the forest. He was a powerful demon, and he had been sh he shot by an arrow with Ram and, and knocked him 800 miles into the ocean. After that, he gave up. You know, he retired from demon work. He went on on the employment line. <laughs> <laughs> he sat in the forest. And now Ram, Ravan is coming. He said, you know, my dear Maricha, you know, you are expert at sorcery, mystic power. You're the best. I need your assistance. I will have a mission for you. And he said, what? And he said, and he, when he said the word Ram, um, immediately Maricha practically went in convulsions because he was so fearful of Ram that if he heard any word starting with R, <laughs> He would immediately become, uh, 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 you know, like uh, apprehensive, nervous. He said, Brahm, forget it. <laughs> Go home. <laughs> you got no, so many nice wives. Forget this program. But Ravana was, was determined. And he tried to convince him. Rarichi wouldn't be convinced. So finally he said, if you do not do this program that to uh, lure Ram away from Sita, I will kill you. And so he gave him the ultimatum. And then Maricha is thinking, either way I'm going to die. If I follow you, I'll get killed by Ram. And if I don't follow you, I'll get killed by you. So I think it's better to die the other way. <laughs> Now, he did make one mistake in his calculations. What was that mistake? Can everybody figure it out? What was the third option that he did not think of? Surrender. He could have just went to Ram and fell at Ram's feet. Ram would have, would have, would have forgave him. Ram was so merciful. He didn't do that. He didn't, maybe he didn't, for whatever reason. His demoniac intelligence didn't allow him to think. And so now he's on the mission. And Sita's there. They're in Chichakut. They have one year left in the forest. And uh, so now this demon takes the form of this beautiful deer. And this deer is so beautiful. It's not only beautiful, it has all these gems all over its body, and the gems are just like translucent and beautiful colors, and the deer is prancing around, and just right outside the her hermitage. Sita's there, Ram's there, Lakshman's there. 
what happens was Sita becomes a little attracted. Oh, Ram, look at that deer. How beautiful. It would be so nice to have that deer back when we go to Ayodhya. Please get that deer for me. She apparently falls frail to these propensities of material desire. So Ram doesn't say anything. And then she persists, trying to say, you know, I'm your wife. And, you know, she gives me so many reasons why she should have the deer. And then, you know, Lakshman's looking at the deer and he's thinking, this is not part of the 8,400,000 species. <laughs> something else <laughs> but and for one re uh, whatever reason Ram didn't notice or at least he's covered by the the yoga maya potency and so then the deer starts prancing away and running into the forest and Sita goes oh Ram please get that deer for me oh so he, there he goes go ahead please. Mm -hmm. so you know Ram says to Lakshman oh, I'm, I'm going you stay here and you guard Sita because there's so many rakshas this is a dangerous place so Ram goes following the deer. Now Sita is there with Lakshman. And after some time, Ram realizes it's not a deer, it's a demon. So, you ready? <laughs> <laughs> he shoots an arrow. <laughs> and he hits the deer. And the deer calls out in a very perfect expression of Ram's voice Lakshman, help! Perfect. He had that mystic power even while dying. And Sita hears it. And so does Lakshman. Now Sita's thinking Ram's in trouble. She turns to Lakshman. He's calling for you. Your brother needs your help. Call. Lakshman said, he doesn't need my help. He can do it himself. She said, no, no, go, please. He's calling for you. He wants you. Lakshman's not budging. Finally, she turns, and her whole mind changes. Words. Take the word, words, W-O-R-D-S. Sticks and stones can break your bones, but words, names can never hurt you. You heard that little jingle? They say, you know, somebody says something, the words will never hurt you, right? Is it true? Take the same five letters and change it around. S-W-O-R-D. Sword. They cut. Mm. So she was using these cutting words. Ah, now I understand, Lakshman. You just want to be with me. You don't care about your brother. Whoa, he's a Kshatriya. <laughs> you don't do that with Kshatriya. And you know, he never, in the, even in the slightest movement of his eyes, ever disrespected him. Sita. And it says in the Ramayana, he would never look above her feet. He would always approach her and look at her feet when he was sp speaking to her. He worshipped her as much as he worshipped his brother Ram. That was his love. And now she's saying the opposite. When you get bad words from one who is a stranger or an enemy can somehow tolerate it. And when you get bad words from someone who's close to you, it goes right to the heart. It's like a sword cutting you. And if you're not expecting it, and you don't expect it from dear ones, right, that hurts even more. And it's sometimes it's just intolerable. You just want to go. You don't want to even stay around anymore. It's just so. Therefore, what is the message? Always think before speaking, or try to think about how your words are going to affect the person you're going to speak to. When the tongue destroys the intelligence and speaks what the rascal mind wants and one doesn't use their what we say good sense of cautionary uh, reflection reflecting on what is you know about to happen 
And then sometimes we say things and we don't even mean it. We don't, we don't, a lot of times when we do that, we don't even mean to hurt someone, but it comes out and it's accepted in, the, in that way. So being sensitive towards those persons you're speaking to means to, to know a little bit about them. Mm. The other day I told a, I said something funny, which I thought was funny, but the person I said it to didn't think it was funny. <laughs> So they didn't say anything, nor did they even react to it, but I could understand my joke was not so much appreciated. <laughs> so yeah, sometimes we make mistakes and we somehow speak wrongly, or sometimes we, we're, we are in a disturbed situation for whatever reason, it has nothing to do with the person that you're with. And then you speak that disturbances to others and it comes out, and it's just, it's not about them or the situation, it's just that you're disturbed. I remember I was doing some volunteer work in one place in America, we were doing some feeding homeless, so we had would go to a kitchen and we would cook for the homeless. And so there was various volunteers that were coming. So there was one man, he was coming every day and then one day he came and he was in really bad mood. Nobody could, nobody could talk to him and, and, and you know he was just lashing out. So you know somebody said something. Well, you know why are you like that? He said I didn't have my coffee today. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, I, you know I can't function without my coffee. <laughs> so it has nothing to do with the the situation. Is that we somehow we're disturbed and it comes out so. That has to be checked by introspective and seeing how it and the words will affect another. So when we get it from someone who's close to us, and, and that's how Lakshman got it, he was, you know, he said, all right, I will go, but I know you won't be here when I come back. He actually told her that. He said, but I will give you some protection. He took his bow and he drew a circle around Sita and said, stay within this chatur vyuha. You will be protected. Don't go outside. And he left. And of course, at that time, Ravana came in the disguise of a, a sadhu and on the plea of not eating and using that as a way to get the sympathy of Sita he uh, lured her out of the circle. Mm. He was standing outside and he said, oh, Mataji, I, I haven't eaten for days. I'm so hungry. Please give me some food. She said, come here. He said, oh, I'm so weak. I can't even move. Please bring it. So she got, you know, she got a little, you know, bewildered by him and she stepped out. She didn't follow Lakshman. And that was the whole capture of Sita. <coughs> and then when Ram realized that Lakshman came to the forest and saw Lakshman, he immediately said, let's go back, Sita's in danger. So when they went back, then they realized what had happened. <coughs> and that's in that from what here, and that then the whole Ramayan starts to unfold into the you know recovery of Sita. And that's a beautiful, I mean, the whole Ramayan is just filled with there's so much love in it, so many good qualities that devotees can hear about and appreciate and glorify the Lord with. It's just filled, but there's a lot of anguish in there. It says that when Hanuman, when he, he hears the speaking of the Ramayan, he cries. He cries. And he's overwhelmed just hearing how Sita had to you know, be separated from, from Ram. It breaks his heart. Okay. Okay, so this is... So the message of this particular story is be a little reflective in how we communicate either actions and words with others. And this lesson is for me. Sometimes I get a little overwhelmed. <laughs>
I apologize for those I pushed into the kirtan last night that didn't want to get in. <laughs> but my apology is not completely an apology. <laughs> I apologize not for not because I did it, but because you didn't like what I did. <laughs> but you went in anyway, so that was good. <laughs> anyway. So sometimes we do things that you know, we have to be very sensitive to that because uh, devotees are very precious and therefore one should not offend or dis cause disturbance in the minds of devotees. Yeah. Okay, any, any further questions on this particular point? Yes, uh, Lakshmi, I mean uh, Lila Shakti. Uh, thank you for wonderful insight into Ramayana against Guru Maharaj. Um, from today's uh, narration about uh, Mother Sita, uh, my question is that uh, because Mother Sita, she came out of the protection that mm. Lakshman had created for her, mm -hmm. the whole havoc happened in her life. She was kidnapped and all this happened. Yeah, what's the message? Don't take your wife to the forest. <laughs> 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 that's, that's the message, really. Yes. Yeah, that's, but that's one of the messages of the Ramayana. <laughs> <laughs> but in today's time... Right, isn't it? It's what it says. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the messages of the Ramayana. Yeah. But in today's time, Guru Maharaj, um, when uh, I, I might be saying this in a wrong way, which and I don't ob object to that either, that f the difference between male and female, that di that difference is not anymore. They, they everybody wants to be equal. That's not possible. No. So equality equality is there, but differences are, n are never the consideration of equality. Because something is different doesn't mean it's unequal. Yes. But my question is that in this day and age, how can we uh, re-establish certain sort of uh, form of uh, framework that are not It's stepped? the Vedic culture. You know, we have to re-establish those principles of the Vedic culture, which are taught in Srimad Bhagavatam and in other scriptures. If you follow that, you're, you're actually working towards reestablishing that. But even within spiritual circles, it seems to be impossible because of the conditioning and because of the reinforcement by society. It's not so even practical in some sense. People think it's even impractical what the Vedic culture is giving as far as the ad ideal behavior in, in terms of you know gender and ashram, you know. They think it's, he can't do it. But in the life of Mother Sita, sh there was a havoc caused by only one personality. But in today's society, the society at large, a female um, are, they choose not to live un under the framework of uh, Go the Vedic say it, culture, yeah. and that, yeah. that is why the havoc is caused all over the world almost. Yeah. Mm, mm, you hear, if you hear Prabhupada's lectures and lectures in, of other acharyas, the, they, they teach, because the Vedic knowledge is something that is coming from God. It's called Aparushad. But Aparushad means not man, not spoken by man coming from divine sources. But the point is that the whole society is topsy-turvy. If you want to really establish the roles, you have to change the whole society around. You can't just change the roles and expect the society to, to go on the way it is. That's why the whole process of Krishna consciousness, the foundation that Prabhupada really wanted to push 
in terms of our preaching is to reestablish Van Ashram. And he said that this is my unfinished m part of my mission. And he said it's not Van Ashram, but it's Daivi Van Ashram, spiritual Van Ashram. So that means even within the context of our present situation, we haven't even done that part, what to speak about establishing roles according to gender. But the principle is, is still uh, valid. It's not that it becomes you know, antiquated by time. It's just how do you implement it in the present situation. So therefore, when, when Prabhupada was preaching in the very early days of his preaching, up until 1974, he said, just, just spread the holy name. You can't run. Nobody's going to take the Van Ashram in this age. They can't. It's just. But then, in 1974, Prabhupada's changed. And what did he say? He said, "Now we have to establish Van Ashram." He said, "The devotees are chanting Hare Krishna, but they're going away. Why? Because we need to establish training people according to their nature." And then he, he made a whole program for setting up Van Ashram colleges and training programs. And, you know, it's going on now in some areas of the world, especially in Hungary. They're actually seriously trying to establish Prabhupada's Van Ashram system uh, as he gave it. And that will, you know, once we develop it as a microcosm, it can can spend, then you have something to work with and you can expand it out. But if we don't do it, how are we going to expect the rest of the world to do it? <laughs> we have to do it first. We're the ones that are following that, or are meant to follow it anyway. But it is very worrying to see the younger generation's um, outlook towards life as, as a whole. And that's, that, that's why I, I raised this question about the framework for especially... Yeah, well, Prabhupada gave us that framework. He said, now you have to fill it in. It starts with... It's mentioned in the first candle that, each, that e every spiritual master has to observe their disciples and engage them according to their nature the duty of this. When the spiritual master is not doing that, then it has to be done by their immediate authorities, the temple presidents or their counselors. When one works according to their nature, they are happy and they also are very productive in whatever they do. What you like may be your nature, but not necessarily. Thank you. For mm -hmm. That's why marriages don't work, because people are put together. And that's not why they don't work. It's one of the reasons why marriages are difficult. People who have opposite natures get married based on some external attraction, and then they, they find themselves not being compatible. And then they had developed different interests in life. And then each starts to fulfill their own interests separate from the other. So that's why the scriptures also say one should accept a partner in marriage based on two principles, nature and likings. And same with friendship. Friendship is also based on those two principles. When the nature is the same and the likings are the same, then it's a good start in the relationship. It's a foundation for that relationship. That's why we have counseling in order to bring that awareness about so people can understand, you know, how they can be happy. Why are devotees not happy? They're practicing Krishna consciousness because their their material or their their life as maintaining themselves in the world is not up to the standard of what is necessary for what they need. And therefore it impinges on their spiritual practice. Yeah. 
Any comments on that? No comments. So that, that's what Prabhupada had to say. He, had to say. he said that we have to establish this daivi. Daivi means spiritual. Vanarshwar. Not just Vanarshwar, but spiritual Vanarshwar. And that's, Baba said, that's my unfinished work. He left it for us to finish. And there's some effort in that direction now. And I think the leaders are becoming more and more aware of the need of that now, amongst so many other things that are going on. Yeah. Okay. So I think maybe... I uh, need to give you a little break here. Yes, Mataji? So you want to offer some... So thank you very much. Today's a very special day. Appearance of the Supreme Personality of God and Lord Sri Ram. Sita Ram Lakshman Hanuman Ki Jai. Sita Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna.